So now we're going to talk about matrices. Now, unsurprisingly, matrices are incredibly important to linear algebra and are the basis for lots of the computations and lots of the ways that we think about uh, solving problems with vectors. Here, I'm just going to talk about them in the abstract and some of their algebraic properties that you need to know for other things we're going to do in the class. So, matrices. To start off with, you can think of a matrix as just a table of numbers. Now, in the book and in material for the class, you're generally going to see matrices written with a bold capital letter. Uh, I can't write bold on here, so in general, when I'm at the blackboard or at the slide board, I'm going to do something like that, where I put two lines under it to indicate that it's a matrix. This is kind of like when I write vectors, uh, I'll put one line under it. And we can think of this, uh, this matrix as just being a big table, right? So we've got A, 1, 1, this is a scalar entry, uh, and then we maybe have a 1, 2 out until we get the number of, maybe, maybe there are n columns, and then maybe we have m rows, and so then we have this m by n matrix. So this is a big table of numbers. Often, we'll write this kind of thing as We'll say that A is in R, remember that's the set of real numbers, to the like M by N. And this is kind of analogously to the way we talked about vectors, maybe living in Rn. These matrices live in the space R M by N, M rows, N columns. Sometimes matrices will only have, say, one row or one column. In that case, we might call them a row vector or a column vector, respectively. So we might have a situation where we have, say, a matrix, let's say, B, and it happens to only have one row. So M equals 1. Then we might have a situation like this, B, 1, 1, B, 1, 2, and so on, out to B, 1, N. We might call this a row vector. Similarly, we might have something that only has one column, and so then we would have a situation like this, where maybe we have C11, C21, down to CM1, and we might call this a column vector. Matrices add element-wise, much in the same way that vectors do, at least vectors in Rn. And so if we have uh, two matrices, say uh, A and B, and they are the same size, then we could write something like, we would say that A plus B is a matrix in which we have A11 plus B11, and that's true for all of the entries. And then we have B, I'm sorry, A1M, sorry, 1N plus B1N, <clears throat> and then down here, A uh, M1 plus B, M1, and then same thing all the way across. So really, this is just applying to all of the entries. Nothing surprising here, just what you would expect from the vector case. The other thing we can do is we can, of course, multiply these things by scalars, again, just like we could with vectors in Rn. So if we have some gamma, and we have, say, gamma multiplied by a matrix A, then it just multiplies each of the entries in the matrix. So we would have gamma A11, gamma A1N, gamma AM1, and gamma AMN. One thing we often do with matrices is transpose them, a thing that makes sense because they're tables and numbers. And when it's transposed, then we're sort of flipping the table so that rows become columns and columns become rows. So if we had an A that is in R M times N, then A transpose, which we write with a little T superscript, then that is going to be in R N times M, okay? So that's following, uh, assuming that A is an M times N. And in that case, what we do is we are writing each of the 
entries uh, in kind of the opposite indexing scheme. So we still have A11 up in the corner, but now when we go all the way over here, we're going to have AM1. And down here, we're going to have A1N, right? And then down here, we still have AMN. So what's happening is any entry in the matrix is basically hopping across the diagonal and vice versa. One special kind of matrix is a square matrix, that is M equals M, that is equal to its transpose. If that's the case, then we call it a symmetric matrix. So a square symmetric matrix is where A equals A transpose, and this is symmetric. One of the things that's kind of funny about matrices is that they multiply in a particular special way and it generalizes a dot product that you're probably already used to. So presumably you've seen things like, um, you know, you've seen things like x dot y for two directed line segment type vectors. And if x was equal to, if we had x equals, you know, a i hat plus b j hat and y equals c i hat plus dj hat, if we had vectors like this, then we would write the dot product x dot y as the scalar quantity a multiplied by c plus b multiplied by d. And of course this is a thing that we can easily generalize to arbitrary vectors in Rn. So if we have, uh, instead we say we have an x that's an Rn, and we have a y that is an rn, then we could say that x dot y is equal to, I'm going to say a sum, so this is a summation symbol, over the indices i from 1 to n of x sub i, so the ith component of x multiplied by the ith component of y. This summation symbol here we'll use quite a lot. It's just a concise way to write a sum over all of the components. So now let's take this a step further and imagine that x is a row vector and y is a column vector. Then we would have a situation like this where we had, say, x1, x2, up to xn, and we would have yn, y1, y2, up to yn. And this gives us a scalar that is the same as this thing we have over here. So this is the same, there's kind of a different way of writing the dot product of these, um, of these two things. And so this is, again, the same as the sum uh, from i equals 1 up to n of xi, yi. In fact, in linear algebra and machine learning, we often don't use a dot product but we write it in a slightly different way. We imagine that all of our regular vectors, like x and y, like things that live in Rn, we imagine that those are column vectors. And so then, y is a column vector, and x is a column vector that has been transposed. So we might write this whole thing as instead x transpose y. And this is the same thing as writing x dot y in, uh, in other situations. The appeal of writing things this way is that it connects the dot product like you're used to to matrix multiplication, and so then we can just do the same thing. So matrix multiplication, just to remind you, is the idea that if we have two matrices that share a dimension, so let's imagine that this is a matrix, let's call this A, and it has dimensions maybe N, m by n, and then we have another matrix that we want to multiply it by, and maybe this one hat is b, and it has n as this dimension here, as this long dimension, and then let's imagine that its other dimension is, say, p. Then what's going to happen when we multiply these, uh, these together is that we take every one of the m rows, and we multiply it by 
the associated column in matrix B. And we do that for all possible for all possible pairs of rows and columns. And this gives us a new matrix that is now going to be, in this case, M by P, where each entry corresponds to the inner product between the row vector in A and the column and the associate column vector in B for all possible pairs of row and column vectors. This is potentially a little bit of an awkward way to sort of think about this. So it's a case where writing out the summation convention can be a little bit more convenient. So let's imagine that we did this and let's call this matrix C. Then if we were to think about the particular entry in C, let's say the ijth entry in C, then that is going to be a sum, in this case, let's say from k equals 1 up to the n dimension n of a i k and b k j. So the key thing to know, to notice here, is that a we're grabbing a row with the dummy variable k, and here we're grabbing a column with the dummy variable k in the first entry in the index. Some key properties to be aware of. The first one is that in general, matrix multiplication does not commute. So that is to say that if I have a multiplied by b, that in general does not equal b multiplied by a. And in fact, in this simple example here, you can see that the dimensions wouldn't even make sense because they would be trying to, the inner dimension would be M and P. However, matrix multiplication is associative. So if I have A, B multiplied by C, that does equal A multiplied by the quantity B multiplied by C. Matrix multiplication is also distributive. So if I have A multiplied by the quantity B plus C, then that does equal A B plus A C. And then the other thing to realize is the way that matrix multiplication interacts with the transpose. So if I have A, B, transpose, then what happens is it transposes each of the inner matrices and then flips their order. And so we get B, transpose, A, transpose. So 90% of the time when you're multiplying matrices, you're doing it the way I just showed you, where you're computing the inner product between row and column vectors for all pairs of rows and columns. However, sometimes in machine learning, you actually do need to do the element-wise product. So that is to say, if I have a pair of matrices, both with exactly the same size, so both A and B are in some, are of a particular size, then sometimes I'll write an element-wise product, element-wise, so, What I mean by that is just that we're going to take the, so if I look at the, uh, if I say that C is equal to A, and then I'm going to write a, a product like that, then the entry C i j is just the actual product of the two entries A i j and B. IJ. So all we're doing is multiplying these things together directly. Sometimes uh, people call this a Hadamard product. When in doubt, it's always the regular matrix product and not the element-wise product, but sometimes you see notation like this in machine learning and that's the element-wise product. Note again that for this to work they had to have identical dimensions. Note also that this in general does commute since it's just, uh, it's just a bunch of scalar multiplications. Then the last topic I want to talk about here is the idea of a matrix inverse. So 
matrix inverses don't always exist, and when they do exist, they only apply to square matrices. The first thing you need to know, though, is you need to know about the idea of an identity matrix. An identity matrix is one that does not change the value of another matrix when it um, is being multiplied by it. So this is a matrix that we often write I, and since they're square matrices, if it's an n by n dimension, dimensional matrix, then we might write I sub n, which is what the, what the book does. And this is a matrix that has ones along the diagonal and then zeros everywhere else. And it has the property that if I take some matrix A that has the, uh, that's compatible with the dimension of the identity matrix and I multiply it by identity, then I just get A back. And this is also true, subject to dimension compatibility, that if I do, if I pre-multiply I by the matrix A, then I get A back. So this is the key thing that we need in order to be able to talk about matrix inversion. So if I have a matrix A that is square, if there is a matrix B such that A multiplied by B is equal to I, that is equal to the identity, then B is the inverse of A. And we usually write that as raised to the power of negative 1. So again, let me emphasize that the inverse does not necessarily exist, but if it does exist, it is unique. A couple of useful properties to know in the case where the inverse exists is that it commutes. So A multiplied by A inverse is equal to A inverse multiplied by A. If I take the inverse of a product, AB, and both inverses exist, and the inverse of the product exists, then I get B inverse A inverse. So it is the inverse of each of them with the order switched. And in particular, a thing to note is that the inverse of a sum is not the sum of the inverses in general. That is to say that if I have A plus B inverse, this is not going to be equal to A inverse plus B inverse. And you can sort of convince yourself why this must be true by just imagining that these A and B were one by one matrices, that is, scalars. And so then clearly that wouldn't work in general for scalars. That is to say, if you imagine that, say, I don't know, A was 2 and B was 3, then A plus B inverse is, so A plus B inverse then is 1 over 5, but that is not equal to 1 over 2 plus 1 over 3. Just as a simple example to demonstrate uh, why we would not expect this to be true. 